All right, good morning, everyone. Here we are. The scientific problem of the age, our age, the age of, uh, of Copernicus. What was the great scientific problem of the age? It was clearly the, the motion of the heavens. That has been the, the scientific problem of the age for a long, long time. Uh, astronomy is uh, arguably the oldest uh, science. <clears throat> we want to do two things in this morning's lecture. One is, first of all, to explain the problem of the age. Uh, if we were all farmers uh, 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago, we wouldn't need the first half of these slides. This would be common knowledge that every, every child knows, every child of 10 would know all the things I'm going to say in the first half of the lecture. But what the sky looks like at night, if you were to sit uh, on your lawn chair and watch the sky, you would know these things um, as, as common knowledge. The second half is we'll then go ahead and say, okay, with this problem, how did Ptolemy solve the problem of the age? How did Ptolemy build um, uh, a model to explain what we see? So let's get, let's get started with the first half. So we'll start from the basics. The nightly, the nightly pattern of the, of the fixed stars is they just simply go around and around the North Star, uh, the central point. It looks like a dome. It looks like a half dome to us. Um, some, star, some stars are always above the horizon, like the, like, like the North Star, certainly, and, and the Big Dipper. Stars which are close to the, to the North Star as they go around uh, in, in a clock-like motion, uh, they never dip below the horizon. But other stars, uh, other constellations are so far away from the North Star that they actually seem to rise in the east and, and set in the west. <clears throat> and this motion, uh, you know, completes uh, once a day. And we have that geocentric model, okay? Thinking of uh, the Earth being in the center and this dome uh, being a sphere uh, all around us. Okay? And it turns once a day. Okay? And not only does the stars turn once a day, right, but all the planets also are turned around once a day. The motion we're going to talk about now is that slower motion moving through the stars. <clears throat> we understand the stars are always turning around in a circle. Now we want to track these seven planets. Yeah, the Greeks. Uh, called the sun and the moon planets. They were going around the earth, special planets to be sure, but they were among the planets. Um, and that motion is separate. These motions are independent of going around, being turned around and around. They actually move through the, uh, the stars. So most important being the sun, it has a path through the stars called the ecliptic. Uh, all of the um, constellations, that are, are in back of the sun as it moves through uh, the most famous, I guess, those would be the constellations of the zodiac that mark uh, our calendar. <clears throat> and although the sun is being turned around and around every day uh, in the direction of the red arrow, it's very, very slowly, about one, one degree uh, every day is creeping around the ecliptic going through the stars very, very slowly at about one degree every day slightly less than one degree. So you go slightly less than one degree for 365 days, and you'll make it around all the way around the sphere in 300 uh, and 360 degrees in 365 days. And so we have our year. <clears throat> we can track the, uh, the sun going through the stars. Uh, most obvious would be to just watch the uh, sun uh, at sunset, watch the sun right before sunrise and see what stars are there visible that are right behind the sun. And you watch every day, you watch every day, oh, not for a hundred years, not for a thousand years, <laughs> watch it for 3,000 years, 4,000 years, you'll get a pretty good idea of, uh, of just how the sky is mapped out and how that path of the sun repeats itself over and over and over again. Um, and these are called the sky watches. Every sophisticated society has the sky watches. Uh, very often they were the priests uh, of society, but going back to our Western tradition of, of Egypt and, and Babylonia, records were kept of the motion of the sun through the stars okay, for thousands of years. <clears throat> we also have the moon. 
right? The moon also moves through the sky. Uh, it's of course turned once, a, once every night, um, but it's that slow motion moving through. The moon, however, moves very, very quickly with respect to everything else. Okay? The moon moves its, in, moves its diameter in an hour. The diameter of the moon in the sky is about a half a degree. It as if you had a straw and you looked at one edge of the moon and turned the straw over in your uh, through your eye uh, and saw the other edge, you'd have to sweep through a half a degree. The moon moves its diameter every hour. It moves a half a degree in the sky every hour. That's how quickly the moon uh, moves through, this, through, this, through the stars. Here's a beautiful picture of the moon about to occult Jupiter. So Jupiter is right at the edge of the moon. If you were to sit in your lawn chair and watch for an hour, what you would see is the moon would move across Jupiter and Jupiter would appear over here in just one hour. That's how quickly the moon is moving through the sky, through the stars, as of course the whole sky is turning, you know, in that, in that, in that nightly motion. <laughs> Here's a, uh, uh, a nice uh, picture um, from uh, the um, astronomy picture of the, of the day, one of my favorite um, websites. Here is the moon about to occult Venus. We're looking here in the morning and uh, the moon, the very thin crescent moon and Venus is about to rise. Here it's rising, going up, rising in, in the morning. And what we find is as, as the moon and Venus rise, Venus disappears. Venus disappears because the moon is moving backwards in the sky at one at uh, at, at a half a degree every hour or twelve degrees every day. So we'll watch this um, this uh, beautiful time lapse picture that as we watch Venus and the moon move, Venus will be occulted in real time, covered in real time by um, by the moon as the moon moves backwards as it's rising. Uh, in the morning. So take a look at this. This is a very cool picture, I think. So this is in the morning, watching sunrise. I'm sorry, this is in the evening, watching, watching moonrise. And watch the moon cover Venus. Venus is gone. Venus, of course, is not gone. Venus is behind the moon because uh, the moon is moving in this direction through the stars very, very quickly. So quickly that you could actually, you know, see, see the motion uh, if you've got uh, patience. Okay. All right. And we saw this slide, uh, yes, uh, last week, okay, watching the moon move 12 degrees every night through the sky. Again, what I mean by these angular numbers that I'm giving you, what do I mean that uh, it's 12 degrees? What I mean is if you look at the moon here, and then the next night look at the moon here, this is 12 degrees in the sky. Again, if you had a scope or a straw and you looked at this position, how much would you have to turn? What angle would you have to turn? Uh, to, to look at this position. That's what I mean by the 12 degrees. Not only is the moon moving, but the planets are moving, okay? And you can actually see Mars move from night to night, very, very slowly through the sky, okay? Jupiter and Saturn are also moving, but they're moving so slowly that it's not, it's not picked up by the naked eye uh, in, in just one night. But Mars, you actually, actually can. Uh, Venus and Mercury also, quite easy to see their motion uh, in just one night. Okay, so we get to the main attraction. The motion of the sun and the moon are relatively easy. They're in the sky, they're turning around once a day, being turned around uh, by the vault uh, of, the, of the starry vault. And they're also moving in one direction, very, very slowly, uh, more or less at, at a constant speed. Uh, the uh, moon about 12 degrees uh, every day, makes it all the way around the 360 in about 30 days, our month. And the sun is moving about one degree through the stars every day, makes it all the way around uh, 360 degrees in 365 days. Okay. The 365 and a quarter day calendar was known to the ancient Egyptians, okay, and 1500 BC. It's very easy to track 
the sun and to get a fairly uh, accurate calendar. The motion of the planets, not, <laughs> not so easy. There are five of them, right? Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, and they, their mo motion is quite complex, uh, as we'll see. So the planets, the historical planets, the planets that we can see with our naked eye, we'll go back to prehistory, pre they always were there. Um, they're bright stars in the sky. They look like stars, um, lights in the sky. Uh, they're generally quite bright qu and quite noticeable because they, they move. They move through the, through the stars just the way the moon and the sun do. Again, we're not talking about the motion of the starry vault. Everybody is moved by the starry vault. Here we have the moon and, and Venus going down, sinking down in the west uh, um, after, after a sun, sunset. That's not the motion we're talking about. We're talking about the much slower motion of the motion through the stars with respect to the background stars, not this much simpler motion. <clears throat> if all the five planets were in a sense of the fact that the moon and, and, and the sun, if they were all fixed in the sky, if they were fixed in the background stars and the whole starry vault was just this fixed set of lights that would just went around and around once every day. It's not clear just if you, if you would be listening to me right now through this device, <laughs> through, through these computers of ours and the networks that we have. It's not clear where science would be if, they, if we weren't challenged by trying to solve the problem of the age. Uh, if astronomy did not pose the questions that it poses about trying to create uh, a model of the sky to predict where it will be any time in the future, if that was a trivial problem to solve, it's interesting to speculate just how science would have developed. It certainly would have developed very differently and, uh, and much more slowly. You could look at other civilizations which did not create geometric models to solve the problem. We're not forced to develop the technologies that, that the West developed, including ma the mathematical technologies, and to see their science compared to the science uh, you know, we have. So it's an interesting question if the motion of the planets were as, as much simpler than they actually are. And what is that more complex motion? <clears throat> well, the planets are distinct in two ways from the sun and the moon. First of all, they're not fixed like, like the sun and the moon. They, they are not fixed. They move through the sky. But their motion is much more complex than the sun and the moon. See, the sun and the moon will always move in this direction through the sky, okay? Whereas the planets will move and at some point stop and stop moving back the other way <laughs> and then stop again and then keep going in their merry way in this general direction that the moon and the sun are moving through the fixed stars. This motion here is the famous retrograde motion, what it's called, the motion literally backwards in its path. Here's the motion of, uh, 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 again, of, uh, of Venus, I think, uh, in the sky, the photograph. So they change direction and they also change their speeds. Take a look, guys. These are every 10 days from April 1st to the 10th, to the 20th, to May 1st. They're pretty much equal, evenly spaced, okay? But here, look from uh, the 20th to May 1st, a little bit shorter than this thing here. Okay, planet is slowing down. Here's May 1st to May 10th. Here's a 10-day motion compared to this 10-day motion. Planet is certainly slowed down to a stop now it's moving in the other direction. It begins to speed up. Here's a 10-day motion. Here's the next 10-day motion. Okay. So clearly the planet is speeding up in the sky as it moves through the stars. So finally it slows down again and then goes on its way. So not only does it change direction, but it also changes speed very dramatically uh, uh, in the sky. You can see it here in this photo. You can see the difference. The, the, the difference, actually, you know, this is, these are photos taken every night at the same time, right, right before either right before sunrise or right before sunset. Hard to know from just this picture. The sun is either setting or coming up, and you can see the the, the spacing 
uh, of the of the uh, of Venus one night after another, and look how it slows down in the sky. Okay, it picks up again with speed, then slows down again, stops, turns around, picks up speed until it gets to that more or less constant speed for a while and goes on its merry way. So it changes speed. And the planets, the five planets seem to move independently of each other. Not only is each motion complex, but <laughs> it's five different complex motions. Yes, they have some common characteristics, but the, but the actual relationship between the motion of one to the other is not at all obvious, not at all. They seem to move, you know, although they have the same kind of characteristics, they all have retrograde rate motion, for example, they all vary in their speed, for example, but the way they move, the way each of them move is quite independent uh, of the other. And the other thing, what's interesting about the planets is they change their brightness. Yeah, and you can see it actually here in this picture, uh, here's the, just the, you know, how, how bright the star is, how bright Venus is. I don't know if you can see, there'll be a better picture uh, in a few slides, that it's actually brighter here. These lights here are brighter during the retrograde motion than they are in a more normal common motion that the sun and the moon move through. So not only do the uh, planets change their brightness, but we can add that they are brightest during their retrograde motion. A very important characteristic that all the planets have. I'm talking about brightness. Here are the, uh, the brightest stars in our sky. Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. Uh, and, and Arcturus and Vega, all the famous stars. Um, and um, notice that some people still think that the North Star is the brightest star in the sky. No, here's the North Star. It is the 46th brightest star in our sky. It is not at all the brightest star in the sky. Sirius is the brightest. These are the magnitudes of stars, whereas, you know, a star of first magnitude is brighter than a star of second magnitude. Um, Sirius is so bright that it's given a magnitude of, of a negative number. And here's pretty much what our sky looks like. This is the winter sky, which we're beginning to lose. But if you look, you know, just when the, when the sun's going down, now it's seven with the Eastern Daylight Saving Time. If you look at the sky at seven, 7.30, again, it's getting later and later now. The sun's later, it's getting harder and harder to, to see these. Um, you, 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 will, you will catch Orion, the most beautiful constellation, uh, pretty much setting now, uh, heading uh, over into the west to set. Um, and the winter sky is so filled of very, very bright stars. So many of the stars on this list are in, in the winter sky. <clears throat> For example, the, uh, the winter triangle. There's also a summer triangle, but the winter triangle is even brighter than the summer triangle of Betelgeuse, part of Orion and Procyon and to a Sirius itself. Okay. <clears throat> to, see, to find Sirius is relatively easy just find Orion, and the belt of Orion points right down to the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. But we're interested in the varying brightnesses of the planets. See, the stars don't change their brightness, but the planets do. So here's that same picture. Let's look at this column here. It's not worried about the magnitudes. It's worried about their relative magnitudes. The way you read this column here is Vega is marked with a brightness of one, just an arbitrary number. So what you read here is, for example, that Sirius is four times brighter than Vega, okay? And Betelgeuse is one and a half times dimmer than, than um, Vega. The sun is 63 billion times brighter than Venus, and the full moon is 160,000 times brighter than Vega. But here's Venus. Venus at its brightest is 90 times brighter than Vega. Venus at its dimmest is 37 times brighter than Vega. Venus at its dimmest is the brightest star in the sky. Venus is always the brightest star uh, in the sky. When you see Venus uh, in the Western horizon, uh, as it's beginning to set, uh, which it has been for the last two months, putting on a spectacularly beautiful show with Jupiter. When you first see Venus, it is certainly the first star you see at night. It is the star that first of all burns through the haze of uh, either sunrise or sunset. Um, so it is the first star you see that comes out every night uh, in a clear sky. 
Um, and when you first see it, uh, you think it's a plane. It's so bright until you realize it's really not moving. <laughs> uh, and you realize that that is Venus. Jupiter is also very bright at its brightest. Jupiter is almost 16 times brighter than Vega. But notice it's, you know, to the naked eye, it looks also very, very bright, but to a detailed measurement, it is actually just half the brightness um, of the dimmest of Venus. Mars is very bright at its brightest, but is about, is about as bright uh, as, as Jupiter. And right now, Mars is putting on a display directly over our head. Um, uh, that yellowish um, red star you'll see over your head around seven, eight o'clock. Uh, that's the bright Mars. Um, and uh, here's Jupiter at its dimmest at four and a half times brighter than uh, Vega. So Jupiter at its dimmest is still brighter than Sirius. Jupiter at its dimmest is still brighter than the brightest star in the sky. Jupiter is so big and not so far away, relatively speaking, that it is a, a very, very bright star. But what's interesting to us is to look at Mars. Mars at its brightest is 15 times brighter than Vega. At its dimmest, Mars is fifth, five times dimmer than Vega. The, the change in brightness of Mars is very, very dramatic. And that's got to be explained if you're going to build a model uh, of the planets. Obviously, the, Mars is relatively close to us when it's at this kind of brightness, and it's moved very far away in some way uh, to get that dim, that relative dimness. So the change in distance of Mars from the Earth must be quite dramatic. And uh, your geometric model had better reflect that because here's the evidence. <clears throat> By the way, this is a live link to a very nice planetarium software. We don't have any time to play with it, but uh, I invite you to play with that yourself. There's a, a lot you can learn from just playing with this program about the motion of the, of the, of the planets and, and the moon and the sun. Okay, so changing their brightness, yes, the planets very much all change their brightness. And here's a nice photo. You can really see the brightness of the retrograde motion. Here's the motion of uh, Mars coming up, moving into retrograde, moving out of retrograde, and then on its, on its way. This is the general motion of the sun. This is the general motion of the moon. The sun and the moon do not have any retrograde motion, but all the planets do. And they are at their brightest during retrograde. This is an important characteristic that, we're, that Ptolemy and Copernicus is gonna have to get right if they're going to uh, build uh, a proper model uh, of the sky. So the planets are brightest during retrograde. Okay. And therefore the planets have to be the closest at retrograde. If you're gonna build a geometric model, then uh, distances, uh, of course, uh, are, are important uh, to, to create the geometry. And you've got to get that characteristic that during retrograde, the planets are closest to us. Okay, three more definitions before we move on to uh, Ptolemy's system, and I'll stop. I'll stop for questions. Okay. <clears throat> Here we have uh, the motion of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in the ge geocentric system. Here, the Sun and the, these planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, are beyond the Sun. They are further away uh, than the Sun in Ptolemy's system. <clears throat> and we have two definitions: the conjunction of a planet with the sun is when the planet is in the same part of the sky as the sun, okay? For example, this would be the new moon, uh, but the moon would be here, but again, it would be in the same part of the sky. It is right in front or behind the moon. That's called a conjunction. <clears throat> Looking from the earth, you see the sun, and here is the planet uh, in the same part of the sky, in the same constellation, uh, very, very close. And the opposite is called opposition. Opposition is when the sun and the, and the planet are on opposite parts of the sky. Okay? The sun is on one part of the sky and the, the planet is on the other, or for example, the full moon. Okay? This, is an, this is where the full moon would be. Okay? And this is where we would see uh, the planet over our head at midnight. Okay? So the opposition of a planet in the sky. 
<clears throat> Here we find that the moon is moving with the sun. The moon is, sun is always going in this direction, counterclockwise. Uh, and here in conjunction, the sun, the, or the planet, I'm sorry, is moving in the same direction through the stars as the sun is. But an important characteristic that Ptolemy and Copernicus is going to have to get right is that during opposition, the moon, the, I'm sorry, the three planets are moving in retrograde. And as we know, they're at their brightest. So here is a real nice set of conditions that the models have to get right that for Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, those three planets, when they're in opposition, they are moving in retrograde, they are moving uh, opposite direction uh, of the general direction, and they are at their brightest. We'll have to see if Ptolemy can get these conditions correct. One more definition, uh, and then, and then uh, stop. The elongation, uh, of anything uh, in astronomy is called the, the elongation is the angular separation of that thing from the sun. So here is the elongation of the planets uh, from the sun. And we look at uh, the setting sun, we see Venus in the sky. Venus will follow the sun down, it'll also set. This is what we've been seeing really for all of January and February uh, is this, this picture. But Venus is getting you know, closer and closer um, actually, I'm sorry, Venus is actually getting further and further away from the sun. But on any given night, you go ahead and take a look at the setting sun. You move that straw up in your eye to see how much you have to swing up to see Venus through the straw. And this angular separation is the elongation of the planet with the sun. Okay. Turns out, uh, well, just go back to our definition that we just did. Conjunction is when you have an elongation of about zero, right? When there's hardly any angular separation be just between the sun and the planet. And opposition is when you have an elongation of 180 degrees, when you've got to sweep all the way around the other side of the dome to see, um, to see the planet on the opposite side, like for example, the full moon. As the sun is setting in the west, the full moon is coming up in the east. So this is the notion of, uh, of the elongation of the planets. I mentioned this because Mercury and Venus have a very, very important property that are not shared by Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Mercury and Venus have a <clears throat> bounded elongation. Mercury and Venus are never all that far away from the sun in the starry vault. Okay? <clears throat> Mercury never gets as far away from about 22 degrees away from the sun. Venus gets, uh, can get up to about 46 degrees away from the sun, but they are both bound to the sun. Here's again a nice picture. Uh, I think we're looking in the east, we're looking at sunrise, and here is Mercury. And if you take a picture every single sunrise at five in the morning, for example, right before the sun comes up, this would bear, this is where Mercury would be. And it's getting higher and higher and higher in the sky. It's getting further and further away from the sun. Its elongation here is growing. It'll hit a maximum, and at some, at some point, it will start to turn around and come back down. It is bound to the sun in some way. This is only true for Mercury and Venus. Venus is also bound, but it gets, has, more, has more latitude. It can get up to about 46, 48 degrees away from the sun. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn do not have this characteristic. They can be anywhere in the sky. You will never see Venus and Mercury over your head at midnight, never. Can never be that far away from the sun, not even close. Whereas yes, you very much can see Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn as you can Mars right now directly overhead um, at mid midnight. So here is a characteristic that again, we're gonna to have to get right, that Ptolemy and Copernicus are gonna to have to get right. They're gonna to have to have the bounded elongation of Mercury and Venus and not have the bounded elongation of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Why is that the case? Well, the sky watchers will tell you, that's what we've been seeing for thousands of years. You're the one who's building the model. I don't know why, but this is what we see. These are the empirical facts. This is how the sky behaves. You tell me why <laughs> this happens. Okay, so let us look at that bounded elongation and then I'll, then I'll stop for questions. So here is Venus. Uh, with a, it never gets any farther away than say 46 degrees. Here's the sun here. 
And here's Venus in the sky. And we have the background stars here and we measure the stars behind Venus, the stars behind the sun. And we find that the sweep from Venus to the sun in the sky is 46 degrees. Never gets any further than that. Here's the motion of the sun through the sky, through the ecliptic, and Venus will move with the sun from that uh, uh, east western elongation past the sun. It's actually moving faster than the sun. It'll catch up to the sun and pass it. And it'll go past it and go further and further and further until some point it stops. The sun will not let it get any further away from it than the 46 degrees. It'll slow down, turn around, and move in the retrograde motion. And it'll swing back and forth and back and forth like it's on a rubber band uh, connected to the sun. And so this is that retrograde motion. And this is where Venus and Mercury are at its brightest. They're at its brightest during this conjunction. Okay? So although we see it without any depth perception in the sky, it simply swings back and forth and back and forth. But somehow or other, when you build your geometric model, it's going to have to be close to the Earth as it moves in the direction of the sun. I'm sorry, has to be far away from the sun. It's furthest away from the sun as it's moving in this direction. And somehow or other, it's got to be very close to the Earth when it's moving towards retrograde. All we see without any depth perception is it's swinging back and forth in the sky. But the geometric model is going to have to show that we're far away in this direction and close to the Earth in this direction. That's, to, that's the way to accommodate the changing brightness. And as we see, the changing brightness of Venus is very, very dramatic. Okay. Always very bright, but it's changed. Its relative change is quite, quite dramatic. And so that's it. Those are the characteristics that um, retrograde is at its brightness. Okay, so for Mercury, Venus, uh, we have bounded, bounded elongation. It better be its dimmest in, during its easterly motion conjunction, and it better be its brightest during its westerly conjunction. Right? There is no opposition here. Mercury and Venus are never at opposition. They are bounded. They have a bounded elongation. So, summary slide. We've seen this slide before. The planets are not fixed, but like the sun and the moon, they move relative to the fixed stars. However, their motion is much more complex. They have a changing direction, which you call the retrograde motion. They have changing speeds, and they seem to move independently of each other, although they have common characteristics. And particularly, there are actually two families of these planets. Mercury and Venus have one set of characteristics that are not shared by Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. <clears throat> and that's the business of being uh, in bounded elongation, whereas Mars and Jupiter and Saturn do not have bounded elongation. Only Mercury and Venus have bounded elongation. <clears throat> and they change their brightness. Brightest during retrograde. All five planets are brightest during retrograde. But for Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, extra condition Ptolemy, extra condition Copernicus when you're building your model, the brightest better be during opposition. You better be in retrograde in opposition in the sky. Otherwise, your model is no good, doesn't work. That's not what the sky watchers have been reporting for thousands of years. And here's again another picture of Mars, the retrograde motion of Mars. And you can see quite dramatically, it is clearly brightest during that retrograde motion. Okay, so we will start uh, the, the, the uh, model of, uh, of Ptolemy. Uh, I'll, uh, please open your mics if you have any questions. I'll just say one thing before uh, for a question. This is quite something, these models that we're going to look at. No other civilization built a geometric model. The sky watches were all very, very busy. Uh, for example, in Egypt and, and uh, Bab Babylonia, the Aztecs, Chinese, India, they all had tremendous voluminous records going back thousands of years uh, not, not the Aztecs, we don't have those for thousands of years, but for hundreds and hundreds of years of voluminous records, tables of sightings of various uh, in planets, position of planets, positions of eclipses and things like that. Okay? But no one built a geometric model until the Greeks. They're the ones who actually created a physical 
model using mathematics of what we see in the sky. They built a planetarium program, okay, uh, uh, in the sky. This is something, again, unique for the development of Western science. This was not done by the Chinese civilization, not done by the Indian civilization, by the Japanese civilization. They did not choose to, it was good enough to have these tables of information going back hundreds, thousands of years, and they could find patterns in those tables. They could make predictions about where things would be in the future by looking at the mathematical patterns in their mathematical tables. But they never built a geometric model the way we're going to look now at Ptolemy's model and Copernicus's model and all models since. Okay? This is a characteristic of, uh, uh, of uh, Western science. Um, why? Well, for one simple reason is they didn't have... <laughs> they didn't have Greek geometry. They didn't have the mathematical tools that the Greeks had to build such a model. They didn't have such a geometry. This is an invention of the ancient Greeks, right? Euclidean geometry. And why do this? They were told to do this by Plato. Plato said, this is what I want you to do, astronomers. I want you to build a mathematical model. I want you to build a model of the sky. I want, you, I want you to, the phrase that's come down to us is to save the appearances. Okay? I don't know how the, what's really going on in the sky, but we know what, what it behaves in the sky. I want you to create a mathematical system that will predict the motion of the sky any time in the future and tell us what the sky looked like at any time in the past. And this is what uh, Plato told the philosophers and the mathematicians to do. And Plato being Plato, <laughs> they all did what Plato said, right? because uh, I'm simplifying, but he's the one who laid down that, uh, that dictum to create a system to save the appearances. Okay, questions. Anybody have a question, a thought, comment? You have to unmute yourself if you want to uh, ask a question. Uh, yeah, Peter, just a quick question about um, models. Uh, Stonehenge was some kind of a model. How sophisticated was what they were doing when they built that? Well, that's an incredibly controversial question. People would love to know the answer to that question. Just what exactly was Stonehenge, what it was trying to explain or to describe? What was its purpose? This, of course, has been endlessly uh, debated. And Stonehenge is not unique. As you know, there's a number of different around the world uh, uh, there are these configurations of, of stones and, and monuments which seem to reflect, you know, um, the, the, the sky in some way, looking at the shadows of the sun and the direction of where the planets will, will be uh, given this, the stone configurations. But uh, this is a tremendous area of research, has been for a long, long time, and uh, still is very, very controversial. I think people have, have agreed that it has something to do with their astronomy, of, the, of those people who built those things, that they were markers that when Sirius was just above this particular stone for the first night, that would maybe the time when you start to plant uh, you know, your, your, your crops and things like that, speculations like that. But uh, the, the true answer to your question is still very much unknown, probably will never be known. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I, I, this, this is more of a historical or anthropological question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, but uh, it, it's my understanding that the invention of writing in ancient Greece uh, uh, occurred somewhere around the time of <clears throat> Socrates, which would be what, 400 BC, something like that? Oh, gosh, so, no. No, it was much, much earlier than Socrates. Writing goes much earlier. Yeah. Are you much sure about that? Couple of hundred years, yes, yeah. Well, even writing if, goes back. Writing goes back to the cuneiform writings of uh, of the Egyptians, which is uh, you know one thousand five hundred BC. So the records that we have are that you talk about records for hundreds or even thousands of years. That seems to me sort of incredible. I mean, what what were the, were those records in stone? Were they? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. If you take a look at the website that I suggested in, in Tuesday's email, the history yeah. of cosmology, uh, it goes all the way back to the beginning and you'll see pictures of those stones on that website. 
the uh, cuneiform tablets that the Babylonians kept of these wonderful uh, astronomical records. Yeah. Wow, okay. there's a lot of stones, huh? There's a lot of stones. Go ahead, take a look at that website. Uh, you'll be interested in that. Okay, thank you. Let me continue. Let, let's continue on. If you, everybody could uh, go back and mute themselves. Uh, so we now look at, 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 at Ptolemy's system. Ptolemy certainly is the epitome of, uh, of, uh, of Greek astronomy, using all the mathematics that came before, uh, before him. Um, he worked at Alexandria in, you know, in the 80s, 100 to 170 AD, uh, apparently. He worked in Alexandria. He was a Roman citizen. Uh, this is now the Roman world. He was a great geographer, besides an astronomer uh, and mathematician. Here's that great map that entered into Europe at 1400 that we saw last week. He also made a word, a world map. Uh, if you want to look up on the web, you want to Google Ptolemy's world map. I think you'll find it very interesting. But we're uh, concerned, of course, with you know his his, his astronomy. <clears throat> he used basically three kinds of geometric devices. One is called the eccentric point. Here we have the orbit of the sun. And the Earth is not at the center of the orbit of the sun, okay? The Earth is still the center of the universe. That we can't change. It just simply has taken the orbit of the sun and moved it off center uh, from the Earth. So this is a device that was used very successfully, invented by Hipparchus, astronomer, way before him, uh, around 100 uh, BC. And this accomplishes the motion of the sun very, very nicely to just move the earth to an, an eccentric point, an off-center point to the sun. Reason why it works so nicely is because this of course is very much exaggerated. Uh, the earth is not that far away from the center of the orbit of the sun uh, in, their, in their model. I, this is just so you can, we can see it easily. But when you move, uh, when, you, when you watch a, a circle from a slightly off-center point, as you watch the, the point move around that circle, when you're a little bit off center, that motion looks like it's moving in an ellipse. Yeah, and that's of course the right answer, right? We know that the earth is going around the sun in, as an ellipse, and therefore the sun is going around us in an ellipse. And that's why this off center device works very, very nicely for the sun. We don't need anything fancier than this the, the Earth just makes a simple ellipse around the sun. And uh, looking at the sun from an off-center point very much mathematically uh, produces that kind of an effect. So here is the eccentric point that Ptolemy will use. He'll use it also with the planets as well. However, it is a step away from the cosmology of Plato and Aristotle. They didn't like the idea, you know, the Earth is the center of the universe so all these uh, motions should be centered at the earth. <laughs> but we're now dealing with astronomers. We're dealing with mathematicians. They need extra elbow room. If you want me to save the appearances, Plato, <laughs> I can't always have the sun in the direct center, sorry. I can, I can build a much better geometric model if you begin to let, give me these kinds of latitudes, mathematical latitudes, degrees of freedom, okay? But it is a slight step away from the idea of the sun being the center of everything. I'm sorry, the earth being the center of everything. And again, in uh, uh, Ptolemy's model, it's not that the earth is not the center of the universe. It's just that the orbit, and I use that word advisedly, I'll, um, I'll clarify that in a, in a little while. The path of the sun is pushed so that the earth is no longer in the center of that path. The big device is the device of Apollonius which is the deference circle and the epicycle circle. <clears throat> okay, we have the earth at the center. We have a circle created, a large circle generally called the deference circle. We have an epicycle circle and the planet goes around the epicycle as the entire epicycle goes around the deferent around the earth. Okay. This is a very, very powerful device invented again by Apollonius, one of the great mathematicians of the Greek world. Um, and you can see it solves the problem of the distance. Here we have the planet far away from the Earth. Here at this point in the epicycle, it'll be closer to the Earth. So we do have a changing of brightness using this device. Okay? It is all circular motion, which is what Plato and Aristotle insisted upon. And this point here, carrying around the epicycle, will go around at a constant speed. 
very, very important. And the planet will go around the epicycle at a constant speed. So these are constant speed circles and combinations of such, but you can get quite an interesting uh, and varied kinds of motion depending upon how big you want this deferent to be, how fast you want the A point to go around, how big you want this epicycle to be, how fast you want to be. There's a lot of degrees of freedom here to create a lot of different kinds of paths. Very, very powerful device given to us by Apollonius, used by both Hipparchus and most importantly for us by Ptolemy. This will be the workhorse that we'll see in the, uh, in the pictures that we go forward with, <clears throat> the different epicycle mechanism. The great irony, of course, of, the, of Apollonius giving us this very powerful uh, method is what he is most famous about in the history of mathematics is his uh, development of the mathematics of the conic sections, the circle, the, the ellipse, the parabola, and the hyperbola. Uh, his his eight-volume work is one of the great works of, uh, of, Greek, of Greek mathematics, and uh, he pretty much wrote the book on, uh, on, on the conic sections. And all mathematicians have studied that book, you know, all the way through, certainly the, the, um, uh, the scientific revolution. Once we have analytic geometry, these methods become very old and very difficult, and analytic geometry is a much more powerful and easier way to investigate these curves. But until then, until the scientific revolution and the development of analytic geometry, this was the way all mathematicians uh, studied the conic sections. What the great irony is, of course, is these paths are so important in our story. Okay, the, the ellipse, of course, will be the true motion of the planets going around the sun, and the parabola, as Galileo will show us, is the motion of projectiles as it goes through uh, space without, if you take away friction. So this mathematics was all laid out, you know, 1,000, 1,500 years before they, they were needed, and they were studied just because they were beautiful, just because they were interesting. There was no application of these curves uh, uh, for Apollonius or any other mathematicians uh, of his time. They were studied for pure mathematics. They found their application uh, uh, in, uh, in, the sci in the scientific revolution. Uh, however, the, epi the different epicycle mechanism was so powerful and so flexible, as we'll see, that all subsequent astronomers have used this mechanism right up until the time of Kepler. Yeah, Copernicus used the different epicycle mechanism, as we'll see. And the last point, the last thing in, their, in Ptolemy's bag of tricks uh, to create a geometric model is the famous or the infamous equant point. Here's another point in the orbit. Here we have the center of the deferent, and here we have the Earth possibly uh, off center as an eccentric point. You can either do that or not. But if you do have the Earth off center uh, on the path of the deferent, what Ptolemy did was he created a point symmetrically on the other side. It's called the equant point. How far away the Earth is from the center, here the equant is going to be equally distant on the other side. And what Ptolemy wants is instead of having the uh, line from the center to the center of the epicycle go around, sweeping out at a constant speed, this line here from the center, if it sweeps out at a constant speed, this point will move around in a constant speed as it should. That's what uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle's cosmology uh, insists upon. He has this line from the equin point, from the other off-center point, this line is going to sweep around at a constant speed. This is a very, very powerful device. If you have this line sweeping around at a constant speed from this point, then this point will no longer move at a constant speed. So if you have this line going around, this radius line here from the off center point going around at a constant speed, this point here will truly move more slowly here and quicker here. This is a, you will truly have a varying speed of this point. Now, it does not look like it's a varying speed, it actually will. You see, with the eccentric point, if you have a, a, a point here, you know, from the center, and you have the epicycle going around at a constant speed, the planet will look like it's going faster because it's closer, okay? It'll look like it's faster here, and it'll look like it's slower here. That's okay, okay? You can do that, 
okay? Because the actual motions are of constant speeds, okay? Uh, this is the way to get the varying speeds in the sky against the background stars. You don't have a point truly going at a, at a varying speed. This is what this will do, okay? And this is a big step away from the cosmology of Plato and Aristotle. Many other astronomers subsequently were very uncomfortable with this mechanism, didn't want to use it if they didn't have to. Famously, the Islamic astronomers who took all this mathematics, internalized it, and continued to develop it, shied away very much from the equipoint uh, mechanism because it did not follow the cosmology of Plato and Aristotle. It, it, it created a varying speed uh, truly in the sky, which is not, this is not how the ether is to move. We'll look at, at Aristotle's theory of motion next week in which uh, we'll, th these, these restrictions will become much more um, understandable when we look at the cosmology as a whole. We're just seeing the, uh, you know, the examples of it, we're seeing the results of that cosmology. Okay, so with those, with, with those bag of tricks that he has in his geometric uh, toolbox, he is going to build uh, a model using the deference epicycle mechanism. Here is a page from the Almagest, his great uh, book of astronomy. This is uh, an Arabic translation. Uh, these, if you look at this thing closely, this is, these are Arabic words. Um, and that's where the word actually comes from. It was called, the title that Ptolemy gave it was the, was the greatest compilation or the comp mathematical compilation. Uh, the Islamic astronomers called it the greatest compilation. And then when it got transferred into Latin, that was further symbolized and, and you know, bastardized to just uh, the, the, a word similar translated, translated of, uh, of the greatest into, into Latin. And that's where we get the title, <laughs> the Almagest, uh, that we, we, we call title of the book. And it is the really truly the first fully systematic treatment in astronomy of building a, a geometric model um, using Euclidean geometry. It also looks very much like Euclid's, Euclid's book of the elements. It all starts with premises and axioms and then begins to build theorems and very much the model that Euclid gives us of how to present any, any work of mathematics. And this is what this is. This is a work of applied mathematics. Remember, astronomy was a division of mathematics. Astronomers would call themselves mathematicians before they would call themselves the word astronomers. <clears throat> and it does follow as best it can, Tom is gonna to do as good a job as he can following the dictates of Aristotle's cosmology. The equin point, the eccentric point uh, is taking liberties there, but he's saying, look, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a, a, a philosopher. I'm a mathematician, and these are the mathematical devices I need if you want me to build a very good system to save the appearances. If my job is to save the appearances, then don't tell me, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't tie one hand behind my back. Allow me to use these reasonable, but I think geometric devices to produce the motions that we see in the sky. And here is the system, okay? Uh, let's see at a very, very high level, uh, see if he can get most of these restrictions right. Uh, here we take a look at Jupiter. Here's the deferent of Jupiter. Here's the epicycle of Jupiter. And here is Jupiter going around. We'll see, I'll show you in the animations, we'll see that as Jupiter goes around, you'll get the retrograde motion right here. As Jupiter sweeps through, getting close to the earth, as it moves here, this is where it'll look like it's going backwards in the sky. During this little part of the motion, this will look like retrograde motion to us. Again, the, the fixed stars are back here. We're watching Jupiter with the fixed stars behind it. We're seeing motion relative to the fixed stars. And relative to the fixed stars, there's no, there's no depth perception here. We can't see, see Jupiter close and far away. We can just see its, its, its motion with respect to the stars behind it. And this motion here is the retrograde motion. So we've got the retrograde motion, we've got far away and we've got close and notice the retrograde motion is when it's close. Ptolemy has succeeded in showing retrograde motion at brightest. One of our big criteria, right? Retrograde motion, where's my pointer? Retrograde motion at its brightest. Check, got that done for, uh, for, for motions of going around the epicycle.
Okay. <clears throat> so Ptolemy built the system one planet at a time. Uh, he took a planet, took the data from the sky watches, going back, he, he, he had records going back hundreds of years. He used the Babylonian records as well as the records of the Greek astronomers who came before him. He used all of those records to build his model. And he took one planet at a time with those records and began to build how big a deferent do I need? How fast should the epicycle go around that deferent? How big of an epicycle should I, should I use? How fast should this planet go around? He had all these levers, all these degrees of freedom to create the motion of, uh, of Mercury. Okay. Put that aside and began to build the motion of Venus. Of course, he had certain characteristics that also had to be true, similar, but again, he could start almost virtually from scratch in terms of those dimensions, those geometric dimensions to build a proper motion of Venus. And then to go on to the sun, he would use the simple uh, eccentric point that, uh, that he learned from Hipparchus. Sun was pretty much pretty easy to do. Moon, very tough. Moon is the toughest of all. Because the moon is so close to us, we have the most accurate motion of the moon. Very, very hard to get the motion of the moon correct. Uh, Ptolemy and Copernicus struggled with it uh, using these mechanisms. And then he would move on to the other planets, building them one at a time. Uh, the dimensions that he could use were so arbitrary that he actually left in the Almagest up, uh, uh, undecided who was closer, Mercury or Venus. He knew they were both closer than the sun, but you know, it, it, his geometry did matter. He could build it with Mercury further away than Venus, or he could build it with Venus uh, further away than Mercury, uh, which he finally did decide upon leaving Mercury and Venus in that, in that proper order. But in the Almagest itself, uh, he, could, he could have built it in, in either way. And the bounded elongation? The bounded elongation is right here. How he did that is here is the epicycle of Mercury, and here is the epicycle of Venus, and he made these two epicycles attached to the sun. So here is the center of the epicycle of Mercury. Here is the center of the epicycle of Venus. Here is Venus itself. Venus is going around the epicycle as the whole epicycle is being dragged around by the sun. As the sun goes around, these two epicycles must go around with it. And look how nice. He gets the bounded elongation. How far away can Venus be away from the sun in the sky? No further than the tangent line, the line of sight of tangent line of the deferent circle. That's as far away as Venus is ever going to get. This is the biggest elongation Venus will ever get with the sun in the sky here. Okay. Because once it's it's when it's here, it's closer. And once it passes that tangent point and it gets over here, it again is closer. This is the furthest you're going to get away. So how does Ptolemy build uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the motion of Venus? Well, he decides upon a deferent point, which is quite arbitrary, actually, because there's no depth perception. Uh, but he has his deferent, deferent size, and then he builds his, uh, his epicycle size so that this line of sight in the sky will be no bigger than 46 degrees. Okay? He has the data from the sky watches to build his geometric model. Okay. And on and on. I will show you a lot of pretty pictures uh, in a minute. I just want to get through the rest of the slides and then we'll, we'll go through my, my, my animations. But you can see all the high points that, that we're worrying that we're about. The only thing that this does not show is uh, for Mars, Jupiter, and Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, we don't see the business about retrograde during opposition. This fixed picture uh, can't show that. And I'll show that in my, uh, in my animation. But the epicycle um, mechanism gives us bright and dim. The epicycle mechanism gives us retrograde at brightest. And the business about the epicycles of Mercury and Venus being attached to the sun gives us the bounded elongation of Mercury and Venus. It's all, all the big characteristics that we wanted to look upon. Of course, the Almagest is filled with hundreds of incredibly complex mathematical devices and uh, you know, and things about the sky, predicting things about the sky. We're just touching upon the, <laughs> the basic ABCs uh, so that we can see somewhat uh, the idea of how this model works. I'm not at all trying to pretend that this is the, uh, you know, the, the, the analysis, uh, full analysis or anything like that. 
of the of the work of the Almagest. But we are trying to show some of the biggest um, characteristics of the motion of the planets uh, is done in this geometric model. Ptolemy also wrote another book later on called The Planetary Dimensions, in which he actually fixed the dimensions. Although there's no depth perception, he actually took his geometry and tried to figure what would be the best dimensions, how big should these different uh, cycle, circles be uh, to get you know, the, the, the behavior that I want. Um, and uh, here is uh, his, just, I just picked uh, three. Uh, he has, in terms of the distance of the Earth radii, counting Earth radii, he calculated the moon to be 63 Earth radii from the Earth. Not bad, the actual value is very close to 60. Uh, we did this derivation, we did this beautiful piece of geometry back in the full term of how uh, Ptolemy calculated the uh, distance to the moon. Here's the distance to the sun in Ptolemy's system. 1,260 Earth radii away from us. And what's interesting about this number, this is the same number that Aristarchus came up with 400 years before. In 400 years, no one was able to improve upon the work of Aristarchus getting the distance to the sun and Ptolemy used that number. There was no better number after all those years. And the motion of Saturn, pretty far away in Ptolemy's system, uh, 19,865 Earth radii away. And what's interesting is the fixed stars was right after that. The fixed stars was right behind Saturn, the furthest planet uh, in Ptolemy's model. So this was the size of the universe, okay, in the Greek model, 20,000 Earth radii away. There was nothing beyond the fixed stars. Right? Um, of course, these numbers are very small compared to the modern numbers. Saturn is actually 200,000 Earth radii uh, away. And the first star, the first star, the closest star, Alpha Centauri is 6 billion Earth radii away. So these are, you know, these models, the conception of the Greeks, much, they had no, no conception, no notion of the vast sizes um, uh, that the universe is actually gonna turn out to be. I mentioned here this nested sphere principle. This is another, Thing coming from Aristotle's cosmology that there can be no spaces. This picture shows it kind of nicely. Here's the epicycle of Jupiter. Here's the epicycle of Mars. And can, can see that the, epi, the extreme epicycle of Jupiter kind of brushes up against the extreme epicycle of Mars. There really is no empty space from, from, from one planet to the other. All the space is kind of filled up. The epicycle of Jupiter ends here, and the epicycle of Saturn starts here, and, uh, and on and on. So this nested sphere principle that there can be no vacuum, there could be no empty spaces, also comes from Aristotle's cosmology, which we'll look at next week. So the strengths of the model, tremendous flexibility, as I said. You can modify all these parameters of the model. The radiuses are the different, the positions of the eccentric and the equipoints how far away you want them from the center of the path, the epicycle radius, <clears throat> the speeds of these points going around, the difference in the epicycles, all these incredible levers and buttons that you had that you could twist and turn to create different kinds of paths, tremendous mathematical flexibility using all of the devices that were at Ptolemy's disposal. And it, of course, had great explanatory power, tremendous quantitative uh, explanatory power. It could describe what this what the sky looked like uh, quite accurately. But before the telescope, with just the naked eye, this was a very, very successful model by and large. Um, and it was mathematically complex, yes, but, but very elegant okay? using all the state-of-the-art uh, Euclidean geometry. The weaknesses of the model, well, a model being around so long is not going to have all that many perceived weaknesses. But it's that flexibility was also a weakness because it lacked unity. You built these, the motion of these paths one planet at a time. They, 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 there wasn't kind of an integrated whole here. Uh, there was so much flexibility that each planet was done individually. And so many of the reasons why one planet behaved one way, another planet another was kind of just ad hoc, just to make, you know, the, uh, the data true. But it didn't seem much of a rhyme or reason as to why it would be this and what, you know, 
What's so different, for example, about Mercury and Venus? Why are Mercury and Venus is different attached to the sun and Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are not attached to the sun? Why is that? Well, because that's the way it looks in the sky. No, I know that. But why, why does it look that way in the sky? Why is it, what's so special about Mercury? And, well, no, I don't know. You know, it's, I, you know, that's just the way it looks in the sky. So this geometric device will make that so. That's why it's so. <laughs> that's why I did it. Because that's what the sky watchers tell me it looks like. I don't have any better reason than that. That's what we mean by an ad hoc reason. And the other thing about uh, Ptolemy's model is that uh, it did not do a good job in predicting the motion of the moon. Oh, it did a very good job of predicting where the center of the moon is in the sky. He could know where the moon was located in the sky, but he had to use a pretty strong equipoint to get that motion correct. And notice that the moon can be quite far away from the earth when the, you know, when the epicycle was here and the moon is here, and look how close the moon is going to be. If the epicycle is here and the moon is here on the epicycle, look how close the moon is going to be sometimes and sometimes so far away. In Ptolemy's model, the moon would sometimes be twice its normal size. That's how close it was. This, of course, is not true. Right? The size of the moon is about a half a degree, and it really doesn't change all that much. To the naked eye, uh, it's, it's very hard to see the moon at perigee being slightly bigger than at apogee. But in Ptolemy's model, it would blow up like a balloon. But he got this position of the moon correct, which is what the astrologers cared about. They wanted to know that they didn't care about the sun. They wanted to know where the moon was in the sky to predict whatever it is that they were predicting in their, in their astrology. And so in that sense, it was successful. But in terms of astronomy, uh, no, not, not so successful. It had to be something fundamentally wrong here because the moon did not change its apparent size the way Ptolemy's model did. And all the astronomers after him worked on this problem, trying to change the levers, trying to figure out another set of levers, which would not have to create the moon having such a great varying distance to, um, to, to the earth. And of course, we have to mention the equipoint. Equipoint is definitely a weakness. The the uh, uh, Islamic astronomers saw it as a weakness, and most importantly for us, Ptolemy saw it as a game changer. He would not accept the equipoint. This was too radical for Copernicus. This was too far away from the uh, cos cosmology of Aristotle, which was now embedded in the theology of the church, and this was unacceptable. You, you could not use this. And once you could not use this, some very, very powerful device, Maybe it was time to rethink things from the ground up. Maybe finally, we've been playing with this model for 1,300 years and we still don't have it right. Maybe we should go back to the drawing board. What do you think? And this is exactly what historians of, uh, of science feel was the motivation of, of, uh, of, of Copernicus, that it was really time to rethink this and to go back to something else because this was not working. Uh, as accurately as it should, if it was correct. Okay, so I have just five minutes. Let me show you some pretty pictures and then I will let you go. First thing I want to point out is I we've been talking about orbits, which made me uncomfortable. We shouldn't talk about orbits. The Greeks had no notion, guys, of an orbit. <clears throat> this is the deferent sphere. Here's the earth in the center. Here's the different sphere. Here is the epicycle sphere. And this is the planet attached to the epicycle. And this is what makes the planets go around. Okay? The Greeks had no notion that the planet could just move in an orbit in empty space. They had to be carried around by something. And it wasn't being carried around by circles. It was carried around by spheres of ether this quintessential fifth substance. And the planet was made of a concentrated ether. This was all this divine substance that was carried on uh, uh, in the late Middle Ages. Now, by the magic of Mathematica, I can turn this this way. And yes, this is the pictures that I'll be showing you. This is the pictures you see out on YouTube. This is the pictures you see in the Nova uh, shows, okay? 
and this is the different circle and the different and the epicycle circle and the planet going around these circles. This is not, in fact, this is a simplified diagram so we can do the geometry, but never never forget the fact that these are three dimensional spheres that, uh, that the model is working with, not these two dimensional circles. This is just for us to, to calculate the positions easily, okay? but they were in fact spheres. All right. I'm probably will not be able to finish all of this, so we'll start next week with this, but let me show you some pretty pictures before we go. Here is the beautiful motion of Venus going around the Earth. Okay, yeah, that is truly today. That is what the orbit of Venus looks like from the Earth. The Earth, we're both going around the sun, us and Venus, and this is what Venus looks like. And sometimes it's bright, and sometimes it's dimmer, and sometimes it's bright, close and far, close and far, using the, the mechanism of the epicycle going around the deferent. The deferent here is in purple, and the epicycle here is in black. How do we get the retrograde? Okay, what are we looking at here? <clears throat> here's the Earth, here's the Sun, and here's Venus. Here are the fixed stars. There is no depth perception in the sky, not for Ptolemy, not for us, okay? All we can see is what Venus mo moves with respect to the background stars. That's all we can see, okay? So we'll stop here. Let me, let, let me finish the motion of Venus and we'll do the motion of Mars when we, when we pick up uh, next week and then we'll go on to Copernicus. So let's first of all, just look at the motion of uh, Venus or Mercury, they're the same. Notice it's close, bright, then it moves away from us, it gets dimmer at its dimmest, and then it gets brighter and brighter, and it gets bright. So we've got the brightness going for us. Notice we have the bounded elongation. Notice that the planet does never get very far away from the sun. Okay. There is the elongation right there, and that opening is no bigger than 22 degrees for Mercury or 48 degrees for, um, uh, for, for Venus. Okay. Ptolemy gets that right. Okay. And finally, the retrograde. Watch when it gets close. Right here, getting closer and closer. Watch the line of sight. There's a little wiggle. Look at the blue line. Look at the little blue line. Look at, at its motion with respect to right. Here we go. Start again. Look at the blue line go backwards right there. That's the retrograde motion, just when it's closest. How does Ptolemy do this? By Apollonius's mechanism, right there. That's the retrograde. Far away, conjunction going east, dim, coming in brighter and brighter, retrograde at the brightest. Watch the retrograde, watch the blue line. Retrograde at the closest. Ptolemy gets Venus uh, and, and Mercury correct um, using Apollonius's mechanism. What is he doing here? He has to make sure that the epicycle is dragged along by the sun. So the largest distance you're ever gonna get away, the largest elongation you're ever gonna get is right there. Venus will never be any further away from the sun in the sky than the line, the sign, line of sight tangent to the epicycle. Notice there's so much beautiful geometry uh, in, of course, this system. We certainly have no time to, to look at that in any detail. But notice it's not all that difficult. The last thing I'll say, and I'll, we'll open for questions as we go. And it's not all that difficult to calculate where Venus is in the sky, right? We have the, this motion here. This is going around at a constant speed. Okay, so we know where this point is anytime. And the planet is going around the epicycle at a constant speed. This combination of constant speed and constant speed, it's not all that difficult to calculate where this point would be at any time. It's just a combination of two constant speeds. Yeah, we've got the eccentric point off center. We've got the equant point. Yeah, it starts to get pretty complicated, but it is not, it is not rocket science to develop where the, um, where the planet will be in the sky using these kinds of mechanisms.
And the last thing I'll say is the great joke is God has presented a great problem for mankind to build a model like this. It's difficult. It's a difficult problem, but it's not so difficult that he made it impossible. All that you have to do is invent algebra, geometry, trigonometry, analytic geometry, and calculus, and then you can solve the problem. <laughs> and that's what was pushed. The greatest problem of the age is what pushed us in so many ways to develop that mathematics. That is not, it's a joke on one level. It's not so much uh, on another. Okay, so that is, uh, that is our, our class for today. Uh, any questions before we go? I just can't help thinking uh, the minds that put all this together and with what they had to work with, no computers or anything. And it's just amazing to me that they could see all this and develop all this math and everything to, as far as they did with what they had to work with. And it's a very valid observation. It is the Greek genius. It truly is the Greek genius. Yes, it's quite remarkable in the, in the history of ideas the contributions of the ancient Greek civilization is uh, unprecedented, really, you know, still to this day, in terms of its literature, right? Uh, in terms of its science, its mathematics, its philosophy, Plato and Aristotle are still major figures <laughs> when you take philosophy. So it is quite amazing. Any other thoughts before we go? Peter, how, um, how does this model explain the changing speed of the planets? Oh, uh, the changing, by looking at this point on the deferent, again, there's no depth perception. See, right here, the motion will be looked slower. I'm sorry, it'll look faster here because it's closer to the earth. And back here, it'll look like it's slower. Even though it's going around the circle at a constant speed, because it's further away, it'll seem like it's going slower. And here, it'll seem like it's going faster. In the sky with respect to the background stars. Okay. When we look at the motion of Mars next week, where the retrograde motion is much more pronounced, you'll see this much more easily. The fact that the changing speed, uh, Venus, Venus, we don't get that. You only get that little wiggle, whereas in Mars, we'll get a nice big retrograde. Okay, so we'll call it a day. So next week, we'll finish off the motion of Mars and Ptolemy's system and then move on to Copernicus's system. We'll be able to com compare the two. All right, guys, have a good week. Thank you. Okay, I will stop the recording.